I'm Jameson Lopp. I've been involved in Bitcoin and crypto since 2012 and uh, went full time in 2015. And I got interested in this space both from a ideological standpoint and a technical standpoint. And really, once I realized that Bitcoin as a technology was not going to be going away or getting hacked and I started diving deeper into it, I got sucked into the rabbit hole or the black hole as some people call it. And uh, I've really been just falling further and further down it, trying to figure out what this thing really is. Like what is this system that we have built and where is it going? So I've, I've really become immersed in the space and uh, think about it constantly constantly and just try to distill what I've understood so far so that the rest of the world can start to follow the same journey that I've gone through. At Casa, we're trying to fill what we perceive as a gap in the market. Basically, Bitcoin has had this promise ever since inception that you can be your own bank. But what I've found over the years, both personally and professionally from, from working on different wallet software, is that it's still very, very hard to actually be your own bank, to scale this learning curve of, of figuring out all the technical issues that you have to overcome in order to have a secure crypto asset wallet. So we're trying to merge the usability of a mobile app with the security that's offered by hardware key signing devices. And we're hoping that this will make it um, a much lower barrier to entry for people to actually be their own bank and, and have their own crypto asset vault where they're not trusting third parties. Over the past few months, we've revamped a lot of the infrastructure and code on the back end, and uh, we've basically got all of the major parts of what you'd want in a Bitcoin wallet, like uh, uh, deterministically generated addresses and segregated witness support. We are ready to go live on mainnet right now. We have the wallet working and we're gonna start onboarding customers over the coming weeks. Then it's going to become a learning experience to try to figure out you know, how much hand-holding is really required for a customer on CASA to get up and running and then just to be uh, in normal maintenance mode and dealing with potential edge case issues, especially if they lose one or more of their devices. Hopefully we will be able to automate and build more guide rails into the software itself to reduce the amount of times that a CASA user needs to actually reach out to us and, and get somebody on the phone to, to get help. So that is sort of the long-term roadmap for the wallet itself. We of course have a lot of demand for adding support for other things like Ethereum, ERC-20 tokens. Um, Casa is a Bitcoin first company, so we will prioritize Bitcoin features and functionality, but we at a a higher level really just see ourselves as a key management service. So in the very long term, we want to be supporting you know, as many crypto assets as possible, but we foresee this moving beyond even crypto assets. Like we think that if the, the promise of tokenization becomes a thing and uh, digital identity management becomes a thing, then the average person is actually going to have a lot of different keys that they will need to manage, uh, cryptographic keys, to give them access to all types of different things that they'll need in their daily lives. We're still in the early days of this crypto asset revolution and, and personally I believe that having to deal with private keys is kind of analogous to the early days of the internet when you basically had to tell people to go buy a modem and figure out how to plug it in and configuring it to, to go talk to an ISP. We're still at the level where you have very raw tools for people to actually interface with this technology. And really what I'm hoping is that over the years, we will continue to build more layers of abstractions on top of it, that eventually using crypto will be as seamless as what people experience today when they log into Facebook. Now, when you log into Facebook, you don't know about all of the layers of, of both internet protocols and even cryptography that are happening behind the scenes. I just foresee that, that wallets are going to continue to, to get abstracted away further and further to the point that people won't even know that they have private keys that are being managed on the back end. 
I believe that the forking of Bitcoin that happened a lot in 2017 is something that was inevitable and it is really a fundamental part of these protocols that they're permissionless and anyone can change them and go create a fork, create a new network for any reason, whether it's a good reason or a terrible reason or fully self-serving, it doesn't really matter. But I think that as we're going towards this future of like crypto anarchy and self-governance, where anyone can, can build these systems however they want, and it's really voluntary interactions that are happening, it is going to be somewhat confusing at first because you know, human society is not really used to this level of like explosion of complexity, but that it's something that we're going to have to get used to. And I think that you'll see different tools and, and, and reputation services um, basically being built around uh, figuring out like how you should decide what is the best system that you want to use for your own needs. I expect them to coexist for a very, very long time. Um, it's, of course, quite possible that there could be some sort of hyper-Bitcoinization event where there are so many people that start to rush into crypto that it just devalues fiat to a level where it doesn't make sense for people to keep using it. I certainly hope that we will just continue to see more uh, gradual adoption of these protocols. And really what matters most to me is that we have a free and open market and people can choose. So if people choose that you know they want to hold on to fiat and have it in banks and they feel safer and more secure in that particular setup, then by all means they should be able to do that. But I'm hoping that we'll be able to prove to people and convince them that the crypto asset networks are going to be a more sound monetary system. The happenings seem to have a sort of delayed effect. And you know, you could speculate that that is due to the inflation rate changing so much and, and the resulting miners you know, not selling as much of the newly created Bitcoins. But the, the main thing that seems to be happening, and we're really hearing more of it even right now in 2018, is people are starting to realize how uh, Bitcoin's supply curve is, is really set up. And they're realizing, oh, you know, 17 million out of the 21 million coins have already been created and distributed. And the next 4 million, it's going to be a long process to get them all out there. And it's just going to slow down more and more. So, that combined with people realizing that a lot of these coins have actually been permanently lost, I think will result in, in the true scarcity of them becoming apparent. Basically just around like the level of fabrication technology and how few people have the silicon fabrication technology. So this is a level of centralization that I think most people are not pleased with. Really what I'm hoping is going to happen is that we've already hit the real level of uh, sophistication with how you can create and fabricate uh, silicon wafers. So like the, these ASICs that are being designed are pretty much on the cutting edge. So we're not gonna see any more orders of magnitude of improvement and as a result, I'm hoping it will become cheaper and cheaper, lower capital costs for people to get into the mining game, create their own uh, fabricated chips. And as other players, like we've I think even seen like Samsung and Intel and Nvidia start to get into it, I do expect that the level of competition in the space will increase. Now, whether or not that is still sufficiently decentralized is something that, of course, you could argue about. It's, it's really an opinion. You can compare and contrast that centralization with the proof of stake and look at you know, the distribution of ownership of coins in any of these networks. And I suspect that the distribution of the ownership of coins is even more centralized uh, you know, with a small number of entities that are owning quite a large portion of it. The main difference, I think, is more of how hard it is for, for people to come and go uh, from, from being in those different consensus systems. At least with proof of work, you can go out, you can buy uh, new chips and find you know, better electrical prices and start to compete with people. Whereas with a proof of stake, you actually have to invest more into the system itself from like a speculative standpoint.